And it's another week where we get to have exciting conversations about real life stories. And one of such is what we started last week on the day show. Julian Sotome is a man who had a heart attack. And then uh, along the line, unfortunately, we're not sure what exactly happened, but medically we're told that he died, literally. But he, at that point, was having a conversation with God. And he was here to tell us all about it. I told you we'll bring you the second part of this conversation. And so it's good to have you. My name is Bella Moody, and this show is proudly brought to you by Malta Guinness and also by Cousins Baby Wives. And speaking of Cousins Baby Wives, so they have a new one. It has a new seal to lock in the freshness, and it's thicker. It is 80 wipes in a new pack. So extra freshness for you. And so whenever you think of getting baby wipes, it has to be Cousins Baby Wipes growing together naturally. And I'm sure that you love your Malta Guinness, and I would entreat you to have it constantly, especially because it uh, is sourced from local ingredients, all done right here, and it's a toast to you. So go out there and make the opportunities count every day. Whatever your hustle, whatever your vibe, Malta Guinness believes that you've got it. So grab a chilled, refreshing Malta Guinness to fuel you the best way you can be. Malta Guinness, enjoy a world of good. Julian is still here with us, and his wife Priscilla and Dr. Jamsin are also here with us via Zoom. And so we're going to continue this conversation, Julian. And I'm sure that you feel you know, very good about sharing this testimony every time you do. Very excited to yeah. do that, yeah. Yeah. I can imagine. But let's just now cross over because Julian still has a lot to tell us about when he came back into his body and what it felt like. But at least let's hear from Priscilla and Dr. Jamsin what it was like that period when he was in the hospital. Doc, so I can... why, why, why did you come back? Because she had called you and told you that everything was going to be fine, hopefully in 20 minutes. And so there was no need for you to come. The idea was I was just going to go make sure everything was all right and then head to work. Well, it was now, you know, this time about five, so this is maybe 6.30. So on the way to the hospital, again, the hospital fortunately is not too far from where we live. Mm. And on the way to the hospital, I get, get a call from a hysterical, you know, and Priscilla who tells me that they see, he actually did have a heart attack and he's being rushed mm. to the cath lab. Now, the cath lab is kind of like an operating room for cardiology where we do minimally invasive procedures to open up blocked arteries. Okay. Now, even at this point, when she said, she said he was being rushed to the cath lab, I thought it was a normal um, procedure where any time somebody has a, a heart attack, they try to get them to the cath lab early because the earlier they open up the artery, the mm. more likely there is to be a, 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 a small amount of damage to the heart. Okay. We say heart is... Um, um, heart is time or time is muscle so for me that's all that was going on i still rushed to the er and um, rushed to the hospital get to the reception and you know and that's when you know priscilla tells me that you know not only is he having a heart attack but he said his heart had stopped twice mm -hmm. i was quite incredulous i couldn't believe that's what she was telling me because i was pretty certain based on the ekg that had been done compared to the old ekg that mm -hmm. this was most likely another false alarm. What does it mean um, when they say your heart has stopped twice? I mean, of course, that's a heart attack, but how severe is that? No, actually, that's not a heart attack. That is cardiac arrest. Oh, that, heart okay. Heart attack means that, yes, yes. And there's usually confusion between the two. No, that's serious. It means you basically flat blind or your heart was basically not able to perform its functions. Okay. So basically, your heart is not able to pump blood to your brain or to any part of your body. So basically, you know, and for all intents and purposes, your heart stopping unless there's some intervention yeah. means you are gone. You How know? long so do you have before you go if there's no proper intervention? Um, just a couple of minutes and then you start to lose brain, brain function because, you know, oxygen, you, you lose oxygen to your brain. Mm -hmm. So as soon as possible after your heart stops, you know, we need to do what we call CPR, which is we start to pump on the chest to try and attempt to get at least some blood flow into the, mm. into the brain. It's nothing like what the heart does, but it's hopefully it's enough to keep the brain perfused enough to prevent brain damage, because that's what we are mostly concerned about. But trust me, after five minutes without any oxygen to your brain, your brain starts to get damaged, your brain cells start to die. 
So it's a matter of urgency that this, you know, CPR starts immediately. I see. So we thank God that he was in the hospital when, you know, he had the first two arrests. So as I'm walking towards the, um, the cath lab, I hear the dreaded overhead page. Mm. And this is code blue cath lab. Code blue basically means patient is unresponsive, patient is flatlined, mm. and it kind of mobilizes an emergency team that comes in to start working on the patient. So as I hear code blue, I start running towards the cath lab. So I get to the cath lab and I'm at the door of the cath lab, and all I see is the top of his bald head, which yeah. I recognize. <laughs> and I see a blue, a blue tube, tube coming out of his mouth. So we see now they put a tube into his lungs to, to help move him with breathing. And I just see this young man standing on the stool, just pressing, compressing on his chest. But this, this, this was a lightless body because it was just flopping around on the table. Mm. But I said to myself, well, if anybody is to arrest anyway, the best place to arrest is in the cat lab because they have a team of highly skilled, you know, cardiac professionals working on him. Yeah. So I just, I, of course, I don't want to interrupt anything. So I move to the control room. The control room, and, you know, self-explanatory. That's where all the monitors are where, you know, the phone is, where you're looking at what's going on in the, in, the, in the lab. So I can see his monitor and he's virtually flat line. He's in a rhythm we call fine ventricular fibrillation, which for all intents and purposes is the same as, as a flat line. Okay. okay. When like you're flat line, it doesn't mean you're dead. Well, flat line means for all intents and purposes you're dead, unless you're revived. So if there was no intervention at that time, you know, if this had happened at home, and let's say, you know, we had called the ambulance after this had happened, and there was not having any high yeah. quality CPR, he would have died. gone. Even if they had managed to revive him when they came, the chances of him having major brain damage and being a vegetable was high. It was even, it was even still high, considering the number of times, you know, he had flat lines, hmm. basically. So they shook him, gave him all the medications, and it's all the way back to the same fine VF. They shook him a second time, gave him all the medication. I'm monitoring them because they are, they are shouting out commands, and I know they are doing all the right things. I noticed they are doing pretty decent CPR. By the time they shocked him the third time, and mind you, they had probably shocked him twice before I got there, mm. I started to panic because I was like, wow, the the, the longer it takes for them to resuscitate him and return spontaneous circulation, the less likely he is to have a good outcome long term. Mm. So I start to panic and, you know, now I'm no longer, you know, his cardiologist, I'm just his friend. So I'm getting hysterical as well. I call my wife twice because I know she's home and she's a powerful prayer warrior and I thought, now we need more than just you know what science has we need mm. as much prayer as possible and um and she didn't answer twice so by this time i think i'm behaving a little erratically because i'm pacing up and down and praying and making declarations and praying and so the folks doing the cpr notice me in the control room and send somebody to escort me out and that's the time my wife calls back um, I, just like Chris Lang before, I don't remember what I was saying on the call, but um, the message she got was that basically Chris um, me, um, Julian was gone. So all I hear is she's shouting, what are you telling me? What are you saying? And then I hear her saying, let's pray. So, of course, you know, I don't know what's going on there, but she's down there with a house guest, the house guest husband and her brother. And they all go to different parts of the room and start praying. But mm. the prayer they were praying was to bring a dead man back. Because as far as she was concerned, I told her, she, from what out, the way I'm sounding, Julian was gone. Yeah. Okay. So they take me out and I meet Priscilla. We hug and we are both quite hysterical. They put us in a room behind, you know, um, across the hall from the cat lab. And we continue praying like true African Christians, yeah. praying loud, you know, 
you know, praying and squealing and screaming to God. Yeah. And they, they had asked the chaplain to, to come talk to Priscilla. Priscilla, what, what does it mean when the chaplain comes to speak to you? When, when I, uh, Dr. Jamson was able to um, get, get back um, with, with Julian, I was feeling much better because I knew, I knew, I just felt like Julian's not alone. Mm. You know, <laughs> I was with Julian and it's that, but um, I heard the code blue um, from where I was and I was by myself in the waiting area mm. at that time. So I just started screaming um, in the hospital lobby and I put my face on the floor and was praying and just, you know, crying out and saying mercy mercy father mercy for matthew mm -hmm. mercy for andrew not for me just for the boys you know and 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 i just remember over and over mercy for matthew mercy for andrew mercy mm. and that's all i kept doing yeah so in all honesty when i was praying i was reminding god that these are your boys and and not for me but for them they've done nothing for you to take their father away mm. so for that was the prayer and that was my focus everything else that had happened that morning i honestly it, it, it didn't now afterwards we can get to that but yeah then yeah there. we we sure will <laughs> <laughs> we sure will yes yeah. so so at this point like i said I, I just kept screaming mercy for matthew mercy for andrew and i look up and there's a chaplain coming towards me very nice lady. I'm not, I mean, she, she was wonderful. However, when she was coming, all I thought was, it, I don't know if I should say death was coming. I don't want to say it that way, but I just felt like I didn't want to touch her. And she came with open arms to comfort mm -hmm. and something that, like, don't hug her or don't touch her. Because if I did, it was like saying goodbye to Julian. Mm -hmm. and I don't know. That was the feeling. So I, I started pushing, like doing okay. like this and saying, yeah. don't touch me, don't touch me. So she actually put her hands up and said, I won't touch you, just come with me. Okay. So when I came, then I went bonkers because now I see Dr. Jamson in a way I've never seen him. Mm. He's pacing, he's praying, he's crying. And I remember him saying, Priscilla, Priscilla, Julian's trying to leave us. Julian's trying to leave us. And then um, he's speaking tongues. I can hear Nina on the on the phone. Everybody's screaming. I start screaming. We're praying. We're I mean, we were on the floor, mm. rolling on the floor. And there was a there was a funny moment where the chaplain says to both Dr. Jansen and I, that he she said, guys, guys, God is also in the silence, something like that. Yeah. God is in the silence or something. And we both looked at her like, I know you must be kidding. <laughs> in the name of <laughs> and, I know. and Dr. Jensen is speaking tongue and we I mean we were praying so hard crying so much like on the hospital floor I don't know what that room was meant for but I know that whatever germs we got that day we got a lot of it my head was pounding from the screaming and then I just hear Dr. Jensen say he's back he's back he's back yes how how so, is that Okay, yeah. well, I'll just hold on to that quick one. Let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll understand why Dr. Jamson said Julian was back and what it felt like when Julian also returned into his body. This is The Day Show. We'll be right back. Welcome back, and that's what Malta Guinness does to you. You should see the excitement with which my, my audience is clapping. But yes, you should make sure to grab, uh, you know, some Malta Guinness. And definitely, if you want to have your plantain chips, you want to have it with something, even with your meal, is definitely the drink to go for. Uh, this is the day show, and I'm glad that you stayed with us. I'm here with Julian Sotome, and of course, his family, his wife, Priscilla Sotome, and his cardiologist, Dr. Aim Jamson are all here. We're talking about his heart attack and how that led to him meeting Christ. But in actual fact, to the regular human being, he was literally dead. And so it, they went through a lot, praying for him and ensuring that he would come back some way, somehow. And we're still telling that story. We're still 
waiting to hear from Julian what it felt like coming back into his body. So I haven't left you yet. So don't be jealous. I'm still talking to <laughs> Doc and Priscilla. Hello, Doc and Priscilla. Thank you for staying with us. So, Doc, I said I was going to ask you, you know that moment where Priscilla said you told her that Julian was back? I mean, what yeah. made you realize that? Because at that time, well, like you know, said, you were very they, frantic, you were erratic. Even yeah. though they put us in a, in a back room um, and we're praying every few minutes out, sneak out and go and look to see what's happening. Mm. Now, don't forget, he, he, he throughout, all throughout this, he's attached to a monitor. And the way I knew he was back was all of a sudden I heard beeping from the monitor, which was beeping, suggesting that he had a heartbeat. So I knew his heartbeat was back. And that's when I went back and told Nina on the other side of the phone and Priscilla was with me that he's back. Mm. Um, because I heard the beep, 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 beep okay. sound. This was after how many minutes of crying and praying? Um, you know, th this was at least 10 minutes of, you know, um, CPR the third time. And from what I heard from my colleague later on, this was after over 20 shocks. So at least I knew that there's what we call return of spon spontaneous circulation or ROSC. Mm. So I knew he had that back. Now, does that mean he's out of the woods? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. But at least we had some hope that, you know, resuscitation efforts. So he was back. I mean, he was no longer flatlining, you know. Wh when you point. say absolutely not out of the woods, what was the worst that could happen at this point? Because we're praying he'll come back and he came back. Yeah, but he could have been brain dead because he was out for as long as he was. Ooh. He could go back into he could he could go back into cardiac arrest. He could have had, had de um, developed multi organ failure. Mm. You know, so so whilst he had survived and he was back, it did not mean you know, we're out of the woods, hmm. basically. But um, a couple, probably about 30 minutes, right, Priscilla? You know, at this time, time we're not even looking at time, we're just waiting. Hmm. The, the cardiologist came out and, and said, you know, unfortunately, there was a very tight blockage, which they're not able to open. They're able, only able to open it to get a trickle of blood um, through, which hmm. is not enough to sustain, you know, the, um, the rest of the heart muscle. And so we, I knew well, he wasn't out of the woods. And so they told us at that time that they had had to transfer him again to a tertiary hospital, Johns Hopkins, for further evaluation and further work. They had put that he was on total circulatory support. I must say he was on multiple drips. He had a balloon pump, which is a pump that helps, you know, the heart along. He had a balloon pump in. And ordinarily, under these circumstances, you know, there'll be a helicopter then in half an hour to fly mm -hmm. in there. That'll be a five minute ride from um, the hospital we're in, Howard County General, to Johns Hopkins. But guess what? Yeah. It was an overcast day, so we we're told that the helicopter couldn't land or take him. So oh, no. we'd have to go by, by road. So for me, that was a big setback. But you know what? You know, later on, I'm sure John Young would argue to that, I think. All of this was God's doing. He didn't want yeah. anybody else to get the glory. He didn't want to say, oh, man, this guy was just airlifted and, you know, everything went yeah. very smoothly. No. I'm just thinking at that point when Doc told you that he was back, what was happening to you? Once, once um, they said he was back, it was more of um, he, he's come back um, as far as he's not dead, I, I get, I'm, I'm not a medical person. I'll, in yeah. layman's terms, he's no longer dead, but there was still work to be done mm -hmm. because his artery was still blocked. So he's back, meaning he's back. So now we can actually do the work we need to get him to where he needs to be. We basically left um, Howard County General to go to John Hopkins because they had what was needed to take care of Julian at that point. Now, what I remember and where God had so much control is that they kept telling us that time was the, of, of, the, of, the, of essence, the essence, that yeah. what, where Julian was, I mean, he could go at any point. So, you know, like Dr. Jameson said, they were going to fly him. Then all of a sudden, that day of all days couldn't happen. So I'm thinking, God, what are you doing? You're making this even more difficult why? Why? It doesn't make sense. Of all days to fly. Now, after they had said that, it also took them a longer time to transport Julian 
even on ground. They had, you know, the, the, the hospital is about maybe 45 minutes away and maybe in traffic might be an hour and 15 maybe. Mm -hmm. But it took about two hours to transport Julian. And, and Dr. Jansen and Nina actually got to John Hopkins before I did Ooh. because I had come home with my brother Derek so that he can take care of Matthew and Andrew. Mm -hmm. Because remember, since 4 or 5 a.m., they've been on their own. So now uncle has come to take care yeah. of them so that I can focus. So I get to John Hopkins, and when I get there, um, Dr. Jansen had even called me before I had, gone, I, had, I had arrived and said, Julian's not even here yet. So then I also started panicking, calling Howard County, trying to figure out what's going on. So again, that thing of that day, God's hand being in it, you know, this is a man that we, we keep being told that he doesn't, he doesn't have too much time. And now everything that you can put in the way is being put in the way. Mm. We are in the waiting room and at this point, doctors are now coming or surgeons are now coming to us to kind of tell us what is the game plan? What, what, what's going to be done? Yeah. Um, so the first, uh, I, I believe the first thing that they wanted to do was try and open up the artery some more. And, you know, I'll hand it off again to you, Dr. Jansen, to kind of explain, you know, right. the steps of what they were going to okay. do. So okay. the, the first step, you know, was to attempt a second time to open the artery. This rather, rather pessimistic and physician comes and he, he appeared quite irritated that they had even brought him to Hopkins because, I mean, to him, this was probably a futile case and so mm -hmm. why bother, you know? He said, well, I'm going to do what we can. And he made one statement which I thought was unfortunate. He said, this is like opening the hood of a car or like we say in Ghana, the bonnet of a car. We don't know what we're going to find. Anyway, after 30 minutes, he, we never saw him again. But this other doctor came and said he was a surgeon. Once he said he was a surgeon, my heart sunk. And mm. he basically said, you know, Julian is young. He's in his early 50s. We have to do everything we can. So the only thing left is to try and take him to the oper operating room and do open heart surgery on him. Okay. He also talked to me in code when he was there, basically telling me how dire the situation was. He, he gave me some numbers, how well um, Julian's heart was beating, what was happening to the chemistry in his body here. His body had started to become acidic. It kid his kidneys and liver had started to fail. So everything was telling me, of course, this was giving me a quote. So Priscilla and everybody else said, two of Priscilla's friends had joined Priscilla, myself, and Nina at this mm. time. Um, nobody else knew, but I knew. And uh, Nina would tell me later that she's, both of them would tell me later that they tried looking at me and I wouldn't even look at them because <laughs> I knew the situation was yeah. crucial, it was really, really bad. But then they said, you know what, we, we have to give him a chance, you know. And so we're going to go in and do open heart surgery. And then he said to us, you know, the next 30 days are going to be tough. You have to give us 30 days to really work on him. So they did the surgery, I mean, because Priscilla was the one that would give the approval? Yeah, so, so Priscilla should tell, tell this part. So they come and give... Priscilla, the, the, um, the consent form and all for the surgery. And and I'm just looking at where are we, because I, I didn't want to be the one to advise her on whether or not to do this surgery. Yeah. Because I knew, you know, the chances of survival were not great. Mm -hmm. But I also knew that just leaving him and doing nothing was not the best either. You yeah. know, but, you know, we're really caught between a rock and a hard oh, place. I didn't know, yes. you know, which of the two was the best. So thankfully, um, Priscilla she, was led to make the right decision. Why is it led, so Priscilla? She didn't look, she didn't look <laughs> at me for my medical advice, and I'm thankful for that. Yeah, <laughs> but why is it led, Priscilla? What led you to approve the open heart surgery? Well, when when the surgeon was um, trying to explain what um, Julian had already been through and the very slim chances that he was going to survive the surgery, um, while he was talking, I, it was almost as if I couldn't hear him speak, mm -hmm. that he was speaking words, but they sounded nonsensical. It, it, um, it didn't sound like English. I'm not saying he was speaking tongue. It just sounded like gibberish coming yeah. out of his mouth. 
and then I heard of I heard again I heard I heard something a voice okay say that um yeah say that he's going to be a puppet he is going to be a puppet so Who, I'm you heard a voice like that and, wow yeah I heard the word puppet what I should say is I, I heard the word puppet and when I heard the word puppet then I understood that this man standing in front of you will not be the one to do the surgery. And I just remember when he kept explaining, um, you know, what the way that Julian wasn't going to make it, he was going to be brain dead. If he came back, his kidneys had shut down, all of this negative stuff. I asked him, I said, well, what's our alternative? Yeah. You know, you're telling me all of this. What's the alternative? And he did actually allude to the fact that he said, well, some some would just let their loved ones go. Mm. And that's, and I, and I said that that's, that that's not an alternative. That's not. And I said, just go ahead and do it. You know, go ahead and do it. Wow. I heard the word puppet. I got that understanding. And in that moment, I said, go ahead and, and do the surgery. How long did this surgery take? Okay. That's, that's another issue. So we're still sitting there waiting. We probably waited for another hour and a half. You know, of course, not, all this time, Julian is chilling somewhere. And we are somewhere. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We wait for another hour and a half, and, and, and they come and tell us that the surgery is going to take about five hours, so there was no point uh, waiting. And so we all went home. The whole idea was we were going to go home and then come back once the surgery was completed. Mm. Um, and of course, you know, there was a quite a, a, a high chance that, you know, he couldn't make it off the table. There was also a high chance that he could have a stroke, even if his brain, even if he didn't suffer brain damage from the time he was out. Yeah. You know, one of the things that could happen was he could have a stroke. And even under the best of circumstances, people who undergo open heart surgery can come out with strokes, can come out with a little decrease in their cognitive function, meaning mm. that they are not as smart as they were. They don't remember stuff as well as they did. Yeah. Because basically what they do is they, they stop the heart and pass blood through a heart-lung machine, okay. and that's how the blood goes into the... how the body is perfused joint surgery. Okay. So just, just not, not to be too graphic, but this is what happens joint surgery. A saw, a circular saw is used to make a long cut and the bone, the breastbone is broken huh? and pried apart. And then the heart is shocked to stop. So they stop the heart and then they, they bypass, they take blood through the heart lung machine while they are doing surgery. That's how they so do open heart? Even... That's how they do the open heart surgery. They break your... Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah. Oh my God. He's got, he's got a nice tattoo in his chest. <laughs> Wow. So as you can imagine, that's why we're so hoping that the minimal invasive um, approach would work, would and it work, didn't. Yeah. So, you know, I knew all of this. I don't think I knew the extent of <laughs> how they're going to destroy her husband's chest, you know, to, to get him back. But that's what they did. Just before I go back to Julian, so how long should it take for you to, sub I mean, to recover from an open heart surgery? Um, at least, you know... If you are healthy and go in a week with with what had happened to him, you know, where I was expecting that, you know, he was going to have maybe two weeks in the hospital, in the ICU, in the step-down unit, and maybe another month in rehab, what we okay. call cardiac rehab, I see. to learn to walk again, you know, you know all of that. Oh, so, you have to learn to walk so again? I, I mean, if, if he's bed-bound for long enough, you know, it takes okay. a while. You know, you, you, you start losing strength. Your muscles start to, to de what we call atrophy. So you need to strengthen the muscles again. Okay. But that was, as, I mean, of course, I was thinking of the worst case scenario, but I thought it would take him at least, a month, at least two months to get any semblance of normalcy, get yeah. back to any semblance of normalcy. Did and that actually happen? A week, a week, two weeks out of the hospital, another two weeks of intensive rehab, and then the long road to recovery, recovery. begins. That's what I thought. I see. Yeah. You're still watching The Day Show with myself and Julian. A lot more to tell. And so please stay with us. We'll be right back.
So Julian, I'm bringing you back in because I want to understand what it felt like when you came back. Well, when I came back, well, I, I don't really remember when I came back. All I know, once God put me back, the only time I remember is when a nurse opened my eyes and mm -hmm. said, oh, who is this? He has a glycoma. That's okay. the only part. But then when I was in induced coma, when they took, they, uh, uh, brought me to ICU, uh, Priscilla came mm -hmm. and started praying for me. Okay. Praying and singing some uh, uh, gospel songs that I like, you know, and just telling me how much she loves me and mm. the kids are waiting for me, all that good stuff. Okay, which one do you like, by the way, the gospel song? <laughs> we want to sing one together. <laughs> These of Elijah. These are the, the days. days of... Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. cool. So she, she sang that. And, um, you know, so I told her, I said, if she had insulted me, I would have heard it. You'd have heard it. Because you could hear everything hear that was everything. happening. The funny thing is, I could hear, when she spoke, I heard it. But I never heard the, the nurses. When they spoke, I didn't hear mm -hmm. that. When I woke up, you know, I just kept looking around. And I was a little bit confused. And I was wondering what's going on. Mm. But nothing, you know... Um, you hadn't well, lost your cognitive ability. No, no, Nothing. no, 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 no. I mean, I, I, I mean, I was actually waiting to see her. You could remember her. Oh, remember her, the kids, everybody. You know, so so when she walked in, I was so excited because the funny thing is, I was excited to just tell her about what my experience we got. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but I had these tubes down my throat, so I couldn't speak. Mm. So I tried to speak, mm -hmm. you know, but at this point, my hands were tied, my legs were tied. Why? Because apparently, when you, uh, after surgery, when you have the ventilator down, when you wake up, the first thing you do is just yank, yank it out. Yank it out, okay, it's you know, And that could yeah. also affect your... Uh, oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. So, so I was tired. When I saw her, I was trying to say something, but I couldn't. You know, so I, pounded, I started puking, so the nurses came, and then they told Priscilla, you know what, I think you have to, to leave, mm -hmm. because um, he wants to tell you something, but he's not going to be able to. Yeah. You know, so then they told her to leave, they injected me, and I fell asleep. Mm. Back to sleep. Okay. You know? And then after about maybe an hour or two, the doctors were doing their rounds, and then another doctor said to the surgeon, I think he can breathe. Mm. You know, um, so they, they called their uh, respiratory doctor or something, came in, they came to do some tests and they said, you know what, this guy can breathe. Yeah. So they took it out. And you could breathe? Yeah, I was fine. You but know. this wasn't supposed to happen because if, you're listening, if we're listening to what Dr. Ayim said, it would have taken you it longer. Taken if, yes, yeah, to be able to get back to, to your normal there. self. Okay. So they called her back and said, you know what, they took it out. So she turned around, came back. Now when she came back, she was walking very slowly towards yeah. me and I said to her, I said, sweetheart, now we've been fighting, so exactly. she, looked, she looked behind, see, oh, who is behind me that he's, that calling, he's sweetheart. calling sweetheart? You know? Well, you weren't expecting him to call you that, were you? <laughs> no, I was like, okay, this is what the doctors were saying, something's off. Something's off. <laughs> <laughs> so I go, how do you have the boys? So now she realized, okay, I remember the boys, you know, so she comes to sit down with me and then she goes, what's five times five, what's six times six, plus seven minus two. And, and you answered it? Yeah, I answered everything. But then I was wondering, what is, but you know, she plays those games with the boys when we were traveling. Okay. You know, but I wasn't ready for those games, you know, so I wanted to talk to him. So I said, oh, you believe I met with God, God. So she goes, oh my God, the guy's off. So now she's thinking, I know I'm completely gone. Yeah. You know? So she calls, she says, oh, hold on a second, I'm gonna call Dr. Jamson. I said, okay, so she, she calls Dr. Jamson and Dr. Jamson comes on and goes, um, uh, uh, I go, I was going down. This is someone who has just come out of oh, surgery. Oh man, she, he, he lost, I mean, he was so confused. Mm -hmm. oh, no, but why were you confused, Doc? Well, you know, when, like, like Priscilla said, I, I was the one who, she who was kind of the spokesperson, the one who she wanted the doctors to tell everything. So when she told me that, you know, um, somebody wanted to speak to me, I assumed it was going to be one of the doctors. Now, mind you, this is less, less than 24 hours mm -hmm. since he had had surgery. Mm. And so um, I was expected to hear from a doctor saying that, well, we started to wean him off this or, you know, basically giving me a progress report. 
the last thing I was expecting was to hear his voice. But not only did I hear his voice, I heard him talk to me with a very strong, clear voice mm -hmm. and call me, use a name for me that, you know, somebody who is really sick in bed is not going to say. Yeah. You know what I mean? He's, he sounded like he had sounded the day before, you know, this had happened. I mean, he said that chair and nobody else calls me that. Okay. So, I mean, it was like, wow. So I was, I was elated, I was confused, I was happy, I was everything. Just shut down the clinic and drove straight to, to Johns Hopkins, yeah. I can imagine. So he comes, and the first, so he walks in there. Now, oh, mind you, only one person can be with me at, you know, at one point. So he walks in, Priscilla walks out, he walks in, and then he comes. First thing he asks me, what's your wife's name? What's your first son's name? Mm. What's your second son? And I'm thinking, what's wrong with these two? I mean, like, they're really yeah. off. Yeah, but that's normal procedure. I right, believe. because you know they wanted to make sure that you know I could. You were there, and yeah. he asked me so many other questions that I really I just uh, answered right, you know. So, so I go and I start talking about God, and he goes, "Okay, now yeah. we still have a long way to go mm -hmm. here because this guy is talking about God, meeting God, and all mm -hmm. this stuff, you know." But then I, you know, I said certain things to him, you know, that made him uh, realize that no, well, this guy is actually, you know, mm. he's making sense, he, you know. Like what? You know, like I was, I talked a little bit about, you know, in the operating room, you know, what I was doing, mm -hmm. uh, what we were doing, and I also talked a little bit about what was going to happen in a week and a week and a half. Yeah. You know, because I asked him, when are you going to, when are you supposed to be going to Ghana? Yeah. Now, he was surprised I even remembered he was about to go to Ghana. So he says, oh, in two weeks, but I'm going to cancel because, um, uh, what's it called? Um, uh, I want to make sure you're, 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 you're well yeah. before I go. Oh. And I said, in two weeks, I'll be home by then. I said, I, within a week, a week and a half, I'll be home. So he you were went, so sure of that. Yeah, no, he, he went and he said, this guy has no clue yeah. what he's been to. Because I, honestly, at that point, I didn't even know I had an open heart surgery. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I came back, my brain was good. Okay. Excellent. Better than before. You know, and this where, you know, you could tell God was in play. You know, came back, my brain was awesome. I used to wear glasses. I don't need it anymore. Mm. You know, uh, what's it called? Now, he, he told you how they cut my chest, chest open. No pain. When you say no pain, what, what do you mean by no pain? Like? Zero. Like, the only pain medication I took was Tylenol. They broke your bones. Yes. You, couldn't, you couldn't feel it? No. Now, now, don't forget, just to, to, don't forget, not only did they crack his chest open, they had been pumping on his chest for over 10 minutes. Yeah. He had had over 20 shocks. So there were multiple reasons for him to be in a lot of pain. Uh -huh. Not only from the surgery, from the shocks before in the burns, and from, you know, from all the CPR. Usually people get CPR and they get cracked crack ribs, ribs and they're in pain. Mm. No pain. No pain. You know, they shocked me over 20 times, not even a scratch. There's not my boy that showed that they were, she shocked me over 20 times. You didn't feel any pain from no, the soul? Nothing. How is that possible? Nothing. No pain. God said, you'll make me whole. He promised me that. Yeah, but if he says you'll make you whole, you at least go through the pain first, and then after that you can... <laughs> no pain. No pain. What? Zero. You know? So, I mean, how long did it take for you to get out of the ICU? Well, I was out of ICU in five days. As against how many expected days? Well, from what, they were, what I was told, they were expecting me to be there up to 30 days. In the ICU? I, or yeah. in the hospital in general? Uh, are you what? In general. Okay. In the hospital in general. And you were already talking, you didn't feel any pain at all, nothing? Nothing. You know, and I realized that my eyesight was very clear. Yeah. You know, so... You know, I realized that, you know, my eyes were this thing. Okay. Now, I used to have this grayish ring on my eye, which apparently was glycoma. Mm -hmm. So I had to do surgery to remove it. Okay. When I came back, that was also gone. Right, that was also what gone. What was your heart rate like? Well, I, I, apparently, uh, and I, I think uh, Dr. Jackson will speak to that, but it was almost gone, if not gone. Because it was a balloon pump that was, was helping the heart. Yeah, and now yeah. your heart could pump blood on oh, its own. Yes, right now it's A1. 
How? This this is a miracle, really. Because it doesn't make sense. And actually, and I think um, Dr. Johnson, but I think he's even working better than before. She said that as a scientist, everything that was supposed to go wrong went wrong. And so even though you had faith, at that point, you weren't too sure if things were going to end up the way they did. So I'm sure you were equally shocked. Oh, yeah. Like I said, I was shocked when he called me a chair with a strong voice. And he was totally complimentary on the first day. I didn't expect that. I expected him to be groggy, to be, you know, to be a little, you know, um, forgetful, mm -hmm. you know, um, to, to, for it to take a while for him to come, 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 yeah. come back. But it was almost like, you know, if he didn't have that balloon pump in and he, he didn't have all those tubes in his neck yeah. and coming out of his chest, it was almost like he was ready to sit up the first day. He was, he was, he said, Achia, you know, I hear I went through a lot. Uh, I said, yes. Sir. And he said, but the operating room, was it really dark? Mm. That's what he asked me. That was one of the first things he asked me. Was the operating room really dark? And then he said, and there was this bright light. So now, this is when he's coming back, okay? But again, I don't know whether he's delirious or... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, I didn't know what it was. It was a med, you know. I didn't know. Mm. But, um, yeah. Hmm. But um, his, his recovery was just uh, remarkable. It was quick and, you know, it, was, it, 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 it surpassed all our expectations. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and one thing that God also did, you know, that was remarkable was, you know, I had two, two tubes mm -hmm. in my stomach. Right? One was an external pacemaker and a, another one was, um, you know, I think it was just getting out fluids. Mm -hmm. The one on the left, okay, healed like a normal soul, healed. Okay. But the other one on the right healed into a cross. So I have a cross Wait, on my what? stomach. The, but that's not the cuts they gave you. They didn't give you the cuts in the no, form no, of a cross. No, just, no, they just made a hole to put the tube. It was in. a hole. Right. But when it healed, the one on the right healed into a cross. How? Right. <laughs> How? So that's God giving you a sign that what well, you went through was real. Just telling me that Jesus truly died on the cross. Julian, no. are you going to show us this cross? <laughs> like, I need no, to see it to believe no, that... No, no, not on TV. But, not on TV. But it actually yeah, healed. But yeah, no, I have, I have a cross on my stomach. No, but what if someone out there is saying you're lying, if you're saying not on TV, uh, you know? Well, yeah, even, 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 even if I'm lying, they should, um, uh, what's it called? They should look at all the medical side of things. You know. It healed as a cross. As a cross. I can see a little scar here though, and right. I'm sure it goes all the way down. It goes all the way down, you know. And even this scar, if you see when I came out of surgery, you see the scar and you see it now. It's healed really fast. You'll be surprised. I mean, if I show you what, what when I came out, what it was. Okay. I was walking on the fifth day when they took the um, balloon pump out. I, I had my first walk. Mm. Then they said, okay, you know what, you're no more an ICU patient. They took all the gadgets off yeah. and there were no rooms available. A room became available the next day. So they actually, they kept me in ICU for an extra day, but I wasn't. But a, you weren't. A, 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 okay. Right. Next day, when a room became available, that was room number seven. Yeah. You know, even though, you know, the only room that became available was number seven. Seven, yeah. They took me up there. So the sixth day, now I'm walking with the walker. Mm-hmm. Then the seventh day, I'm walking without the walker. The nurse is holding the walker in case I need it. The eighth day, I was walking without the walker. The ninth day, I'm walking up and down the stairs. How? And then they said, you know what? Get out of Get here. out of the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> You're taking up space. Go home. And the funny thing is, they, you know, they told Priscilla about the certain things that she needed to have in the house because they didn't think I could walk up and down the stairs. So... They wanted her to create a little room downstairs so, you know, I could stay there and buy a whole bunch of different things. Yeah. So she ordered it. Mm -hmm. I go home before even one of the items came. And she sent most of them back. Because you didn't need it. I didn't it. need it. What did this do to the medical officers that were in the hospital and the ones who attended to you? So I had a lot of, like, the surgeon came up to me one day and said, who am I? You know, and I said, oh, I'm Ghanaian. Mm -hmm. He says, no, that's not what I mean. Are you a spiritual guy? Mm. And I say, it depends on what you call spiritual. spiritual yeah. if, it, if you mean by spiritual, uh, God, fear, and person, miracle, 
loving, uh, believe in a uh, miracle loving God, then yes, I'm spiritual. Mm. But he just looked at me and just, just walked away. And she was confused. You know, yeah. And I could tell he was very confused. Even, even when Priscilla took me there on my one month visit, mm -hmm. I had to go and visit the doctor. The way he looked at me and the, what the other doctors said, I mean, the, the, this doctor came, a uh, lady came and couldn't believe what she was yeah, seeing. See. Based on what she read about me, mm -hmm. she didn't think that was, that was, that you. was me. Did yeah. they give their lives to Christ because of this? Yes. Yeah, so there were two doctors who were atheists that gave their lives to Christ. Oh. And in the hospital, three three nurses mm -hmm. that also gave their lives to Christ. For you, Julian, and, and maybe I'll cross over to our audience, just a few of them to see what if they have any questions. You do? Okay. As you were sharing your story, did people believe, or people believed, right? They, but they were, I, I'm sure they were not all that many, but those people who didn't believe, how did they like, how, how like, did they believe, did, that, did they believe or like, mm. are they still, like, Some like, skeptic you understand? Yeah. Right, right. right from, you know, when I was with God, God told me that the devil was going to come attack me. Mm. And one of the, the third one was exactly that. Mm. He said that um, the devil is going to come with folks, you know, that are going to come and diminish your testimony. But he said to me, you know what you saw. Mm. So basically, he, he, I shouldn't worry about that part. You know, okay. I know what I saw, so I shouldn't get swayed away. Yeah. You know, so that's, that was the third one that he told me to be careful of. And Final like, words before we go. I mean, for many people who are watching you in disbelief and shock. What would you say finally to everyone? Who's no, I, I, I just tell them to look at the science part of things, the medical side of things. You know what I mean? Yeah, you don't believe me, but then look at the, the medical side of things, you know. And uh, that, is, that is going to be a very difficult one to not believe, yeah. you know. Yeah, definitely. So if you are skeptical, at least look at, look at that part mm. before you jump into, you know, yeah. the wrong path, you know. The book is coming out for sure. I'm, uh, Definitely. Do Priscilla, any final words before we go? No, no. I wanted my Guinness, but I didn't get any. Oh, <laughs> don't worry. I mean, we can still toast from here. Cheers to you. So just, okay. I'm going to drink Cheers. it. Pretend you're also drinking it. Do you get it? So, okay. yeah. Okay. But okay. thank you anyway. You're my proxy. Exactly. You're my proxy for Julian, so go for it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so this has been the day show with Julian Sotomi and his family. Priscilla is his wife, and Dr. Ayim, um, of course, is a cardiologist that was with him throughout. And it's been very eye opening, very, very eye opening. I'm touched, I'm blessed, and I hope you've been blessed too. This show has been brought to you by Malta Guinness, and make sure to enjoy it. It's, it's really nice when it's chilled as well. Have it with whatever meal you want, but just make sure that every time you think of drinking something, it will be Malta Guinness. And also remember, for your babies, if you're looking for the best wipes, then it's the Cousins Baby Wipes. It's new, it's refreshing, it keeps in the freshness because, well, of course, they've worked on it, and it's 80 wipes in one pack. So this is the best for you. My name is Bella Mundi, and when you see us again another time, I'm sure we'll come your way with something even more exciting. Until then, for myself and Jillian, and from everybody here, thank you so much for joining us too. We'll see you again another time.